joining this uh, this drivers of change webinar, one of a series of three that we'll be running this week and the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm Jonathan Starr, and I'll be moderating the conversation today and in the next couple of weeks. And I'm working as um, the, the scenario planning advisor to the core team on this overall initiative. Um, so the, the work that we're doing here, you can see that the um, organizations um, shown in the, the right-hand side of the screen there, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, New England Fishery Management Council, Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council, the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, and NOAA Fisheries, um, they're all collaborating together in an initiative to really look at the, the next 20, 25 years of East Coast fisheries and how climate change is likely to change the conditions that we might be facing. Um, so it's an exciting initiative um, in terms of a collaboration. And there are individuals from all of the organizations I just mentioned who are part of a core team who, who are uh, basically designing and organizing um, this whole uh, piece of work. So I, what I wanted to do was to just give you a kind of brief introduction to what we're doing and a brief background, and then we'll get into the, the real, the kind of the details of today. So as I say, this overall work is really trying to look ahead, not too far, but look ahead, let's say 20, 25 years, to think about how climate change is gonna affect East Coast fisheries, particularly changing stock availability and distributions. And the overall purpose of what we're doing here is by imagining these different possibilities about how climate change might affect these coast fisheries, we're then asking questions about, do we have the right governance structures? Do we have the right management approaches um, in order to deal with um, the future in that way? And so our overall East Coast fish um, will be affected by climate change. And then we'll be really dealing with trying to create these kind of tools and processes that provide flexible and robust fishery management strategies. Um, I just want to situate what we're doing today in the steps of this kind of overall initiative. It's happening over a number of different years. Um, we're today at um, basically mid uh, point number three exploration. Um, let me just take you back. We started this um, really around last summer where we identified the objectives um, that you've just seen. And then for most of last year, we spent a good amount of time uh, really scoping this initiative out, hearing from many of you who were part of um, our initial kickoff webinars and also responded to an online uh, questionnaire. So we took that scoping material and now we're looking at what are these forces that could be driving change over the course of the next 20 years. We'll be using this material from these series of webinars then to con conduct, conduct a series of workshop sessions um, in late spring, probably May and June, where we'll be creating these scenarios that might, that might tell us uh, really what the, the future of East Coast fisheries, what the conditions might be. And then those scenarios will then be used um, to identify actions, recommendations, ideas, and all of that kind of really important work is going to be done in the second half of this year through the summer and fall. And then into next year, we'll be um, uh, putting some more material together to think about about how we track changes that are going on. But today's work is really around uh, number three there, analyzing forces, driving change in greater detail. I just wanna take a very quick step back um, in the scoping work that we did in, um, in the fall. What you were able to do for us was you suggested revisions to the initiative objectives. We've taken those on board. Um, you provided a, a good deal of insight in terms of your own experiences on the water or as, um, as observers of, of East Coast fisheries and, and, and the oceans, what you're seeing in terms of changing conditions currently impacting East Coast fisheries. And then we also asked you to really think about these drivers of change that you think are poised to shape fisheries in the course of the next 20 years. Um, we had you know, many dozens of different drivers that you outlined, and we've bucketed them into these three areas, oceanographic, biological, social, and economic, and we'll be using these three buckets. Clearly, there's a lot of crossover and blurring between them. There's not, it's not easy to think, okay, one definitely goes in one or another, um, but we'll be using these three buckets to organize the webinars over um, the next three weeks. So today 
is a webinar looking at oceanographic drivers of change. We're thinking here about issues like what, what are we expecting to see in terms of ocean temperatures or uh, what's happening to currents or what's happening to water chemistry, ocean acidification. Um, next week in the biological drivers of change, we're thinking much more there about distribution changes, maybe seasonal timing, um, things like disease, um, so and habitat conditions are more of the conversation of next week. And then the social and economic drivers of change on March the 2nd is going to be focusing much more on things like what's happening to coastal communities, either po population wise, economic wise, um, competing ocean uses, um, maybe cost pressures and so on and things like that. So in, in throughout these three webinars, we're hoping that we're going to get a very kind of good broad picture of all the different kind of drivers that are poised to shape East Coast fisheries over the course of the next 20 years. So um, today's work, uh, what we're going to be doing is uh, after this kind of very quick overview, I'm going to have the pleasure to hand over to Dr. Charlie Stock from NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. And Charlie is going to give us a, an, an overview presentation, kind of like a keynote for about 20 minutes, just on what he sees as some of the kind of the real preeminent drivers of change. Um, we're then going to go to um, a panel and we're delighted to have a number of people here re representing a range of different kind of interests um, on oceans. Zach Cliver is going to um, join us from Blue Planet Strategies, Dr. Sankey Lee, um, Dr. Shannon Misak. Um, unfortunately, Captain Chris Roebuck, I think, um, has, uh, we just heard a couple of minutes ago, he's got a, um, a conflict there. And then Dr. Vin Saba has joined us. So we've got a, uh, we've got a series um, that we'll come up with. We're going to shift to a couple of polling questions that we want you to um, think about. And then we'll have some audience questions and discussion um, before then setting out some next steps and wrapping up at around 4.30. Um, quick ground rules. Uh, we had over 250 people registered th for this. Um, I can't quite see the screen at the moment as to where we are with participants, but I'm expecting that it's in the, you know, the kind of the, the certainly, you know, 150 or something like that, 100, 150. Um, because of the numbers that we've got, um, they go, thank you, Sean. Um, we, we, we've got certainly over 200 um, attendees at the moment. Um, all parts of the session are going to be held in plenary, so there's no breakout groups um, as we did in our original kickoff webinars. And all, part all participants or all attendees are going to be automatically muted um, during the session. Um, speakers and panelists will be on video. Um, obviously, they, they won't be muted. And what I, what I would ask you is if you if you see that your kind of your your webex interface at the moment um is showing a lot of kind of blank blank screens you can go up to layout and there's a toggle in there that that will that will basically allow you just to see um the people whose videos are on right at this stage so just just something to kind of take a look at we also would love to get your questions and comments and we're going to ask you again because of numbers to submit those questions and comments um, via the chat function. Um, all speakers, panelists, and the core team will be able to see those questions and comments. And in that Q&A session, we'll then be able to relay those to speakers and we'll try and address as many comments and questions as possible um, throughout the session. If we, ca if we can't get to everything, please don't feel as if we've ignored it. They will all be used to inform the next phases of the work. And indeed, if there is something very specific that you're kind of looking to ask, then um, obviously we'll take all of that on board and get back to you uh, specifically with that. Just to let you know, the session and the chat log um, will be recorded. Um, all of this is, as I mentioned earlier, really essential material for us to, to start to build those scenarios, which we will be doing in the months ahead. Okay, so um, with that, I'm going to, um, in a moment or two, I'm going to hand over to uh, to Charlie to get us kicked off with uh, the the initial presentation and so on. Um, let me just check with anyone else on the the core team. Um, let me let me also also introduce Sean, Lucy, and Kylie Dancy. Sean and Kylie will be 
assisting with the questioning um, that will be happening um, a little bit later on and we'll be monitoring the chat as we go through this session. So, um, Kylie, Sean, let me check with you if there's anything else for us to mention right now before we go to Charlie. I don't have anything. Thank you. Yeah, I'm good too. Okay. All right. Thanks everyone. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and um, invite, uh, invite Charlie to uh, to join us and Charlie, if you want to share your screen as you're clicking into that, um, let me just give a very kind of brief intro here. Um, uh, Dr. Charles Stock is a research oceanographer at NOAA's um, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, where his work for the past 15 years has focused on understanding interactions between climate and marine ecosystems. He's one of the developers of the lab's Earth Systems Models, projected from which are used to inform international and national climate assessments and subsequent policies. He's also collaborated extensively with fishery scientists and managers to apply climate and earth system models to help meet living marine resource challenges in a changing climate. So um, thanks so much to everyone for joining us. See our participant numbers now are up to 243. We're really delighted with that. We know we've got a range of participants from, um, from fishermen to fishery scientists to coastal community representatives. And we hope that this will, uh, that this, this will be um, very much a kind of informative and engaging session for all of you. Um, okay, Charlie, over to you. Thanks so much. Right. Uh, can, can everybody hear me okay? Am I coming through loud and clear? All right. Yes. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Josh. Excellent. And, and the slides are up too. So, um, uh, first up, success. Um, first, I'd like to just thank everybody for the opportunity to uh, to engage in this important effort. Um, it's I'm really happy to be here and happy to talk with you all. And my task today is to provide an overview of the oceanographic drivers of change along the U.S. East Coast. This is, of course, a very broad topic, and I have about 20 minutes. So, so. I'm not going to try and provide a comprehensive overview of all the great work that's been done, but uh, really kind of stir the pot a bit with an eye on on fisheries distribution and abundance over the next 20 to 30 year, year time horizon, which is a bit shorter time horizon than we usually deal with for climate change applications, but I think a really critical one for the decisions we need to make uh, today. So. I think it's useful to uh, begin from the beginning and, and, and talk a little bit about the fact that a lot of the drivers of change that we'll be talking about today uh, emanate from accumulating greenhouse gases in our atmosphere that have been definitively linked to increases in emission, uh, uh, fossil fuel emissions associated with industrialization. The plot on your left here is just a plot of the observed CO2 increase at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii really charting this increase in carbon dioxide over the course of the last 60 years. And as most of you probably know, the sun warms the earth, but the earth radiates part of that heat back out towards space. Uh, greenhouse gases uh, are critical in that they absorb part of that radiating energy and re-emit some back towards the earth. This uh, blanket that they form is really critical to making the earth habitable. If it wasn't for greenhouse gases, the Earth's mean temperature will be well below zero degrees Celsius, and none of us would, would want to live here or really could live here. However, the increase in greenhouse gases that we've been generating through our activities is making this blanket heavier and, and warming the Earth as a result and changing other aspects of the climate system. First thing to remember about the ocean's role in this process is that Global warming would actually be a lot worse were it not for the ocean. The ocean's a, an amazing reservoir. It's absorbed 30% of the emitted carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and sequestered it where it doesn't contribute to that global warming. And it's um, absorbed over 90% of the excess heat energy that, uh, that's been created by that greenhouse gas increase. However, the service that the ocean provide has come at a price. And, and the most direct effects of that are warming the ocean and acidification of the ocean. The plot on the left-hand side uh, just summarizes warming over the past century. I'll note that this plot goes to about 2010, so you, it doesn't capture the really intense warming that we've had in the East Coast over the last 10 years or so, and I'll, I'll touch on that a lot more later in the talk. But you can see that there's been a ubiquitous warming of the surface ocean, and that's penetrated even down to five, five to 600 meters deep. The right-hand plot shows uh, observed pH at a number of sentinel sites, including the Bermuda Atlantic time series in green and the station Aloha near Hawaii in, in 
orange, and you can see this, this very steady decline in the uh, pH of the ocean associated with acidification as this, that CO2 is taken up into the ocean. Um, these are the, the past trends up, up to date, but how do, we, how do we say something about what the future may hold? Um, for this question, we often enlist uh, global climate and earth system models. Uh, global climate models, physical climate models, consist of four basic components. There's a atmospheric circulation and radiation model, uh, ocean circulation model, a sea ice model, and a land physics and hydrology model. And these are rendered across the globe in grids, uh, not unlike the models we use to forecast hurricanes or weather, weather dynamics. Um, but we force these models by specifying a CO2 trajectory in the atmosphere and, and asking it whether the Earth will warm in response to that CO2 trajectory or whether other aspects of the climate system will change. The Earth system models add the green bits on this plot, ocean ecology and biogeochemistry, plant ecology and land use and interactive CO2. Once you have those, you can force that model with emissions of fossil fuels. The model determines how those emissions get partitioned between the ocean, the land, and the, and the atmosphere. And these models, of course, also allow us to say a lot more about what might happen to the ocean ecology and biogeochemistry as we move forward under different scenarios and for climate change. The main outcome of these Earth system experiments has been that, that they all project continued warming and acidification particularly if we continue to follow high emissions uh, scenarios. But even the, the low emissions, climate-friendly scenarios still often inclu include a significant uh, continued warming and acidification. And so this, this plot just shows the upper left here is the projected change in sea surface temperature, a century out in time, the end of the century change in sea surface temperature. Uh, the stippling, the little dots uh, across almost all the regions of the ocean indicate that almost all models agree that, that that we're going to have warming and then it's going to be between probably about two to four degrees Celsius on average under a high emission scenario. The right plot is the pH. And again, stippling ever, all models agree that under those high emission scenario, that that pH is likely to drop by about 0.3 units. The bottom left shows the oxygen response. You see there's a little bit more disagreement on that, but actually most areas that presently have oxygen in that global ocean are going to experience declines, and that's usually related to two factors. One is that warmer water, warmer waters uh, have lower oxygen solubility, and two is that water becomes more isolated from the surface layer as climate changes, and 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 they need to get to the surface in order to replenish their oxygen. So, uh, and then on the bo bottom right is the change in primary production, the the base of the food web, and you'll see that is much more um, has much less agreement between the models, as much less spatially coherent, and I'm going to talk a, a bit more about that in the future. This is this uh, pattern of change has led to the uh, expression that the ocean is um, becoming hot, sour, and losing its breath, and the, the scientist Nikki Gruber coined that, and that's a very robust outcome of these projections. But of course, these are at a global scale, and we're interested in, in more regional insights into what's going to happen along the East Coast. These are also 100 years out, and we're interested in here and what might happen in the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, as opposed to uh, at the end of the century. So I'm going to dive into each of these, which are all important drivers of fisheries distribution and productivity, uh, and try and provide a little bit more regional perspective. Let's start with temperature. As everyone on the call is aware, the Northwest Atlantic has experienced some of the most rapidly increasing temperatures in the world over the last uh, 30 years. And the plot on the left just shows this, this warming in degrees Celsius per decade. Um, and you can see along the, the Northwest Atlantic shelf break and, and on the shelf itself, you have regions of, of, of fairly intense warming, almost up to a degree per decade in some places. Um, you'll notice there are areas in the South Atlantic by where cooling exists and Sankey is gonna talk a little bit more about that in the future, but that's unlikely to hold forever given this warmer, heavier blanket that we're getting. Now the, the intensity of this warming reflects both that heavier blanket due to greenhouse gases and changes in circulation, they're likely a result of a combination of natural climate variability and potential, potentially changes in circulation that are also linked to systematic climate change driven changes in the ocean circulation. And generally the Gulf Stream has been becoming more prominent off the Northwest Atlantic shelf and replacing waters that previously had a stronger influence from the cold fresh Labrador slope water. 
And these two factors, the radiation factor from the greenhouse effect, plus these changes in circulation have been combining to create these, these excessively rapid uh, warming in this region. Now, when you step back and view this warming in the context of, of um, the historical record, you see that the recent warming can be viewed in the context of, of decades of, of quite substantial fluctuations that often have a, have a very low frequency character, you know, 20 or 30 years of relatively warm conditions, followed by a drop of about a degree or so, and uh, 20 or 30 years of relatively cool conditions with all sorts of smaller, higher frequency fluctuations occurring on top of that. Uh, those natural fluctuations are, are climate modes of variability, like the Atlantic Meridional Oscillation. And really, like I said in the previous slide, it's the combination of these natural modes of variability and the force change due to this greenhouse gas effect that's generating this large warming. So as we think about scenarios for where the temperature is gonna go in the next 20 or 30 years, there's a number of possibilities that, that come to mind. And I'm just gonna throw these out here to disperse the discussion. First question is whether the Atlantic Meridional Oscillation and other modes of natural climate variability might swing towards cooler states and perhaps partly counteract the greenhouse gas driven warming and maybe temporarily stall this very rapid warming trend that we've been seeing in the last 30 years. Alternatively, perhaps these climate modes of variability are gonna stay in their present warm states and we'll continue to see an increase, but primarily just associated with that greenhouse gas component. Um, the authors of this paper here uh, suggested that about a third of this warming that we've seen in the last 30 years is due to that greenhouse gas component, and about two thirds is due to this variability. A third possibility would be whether climate change induced circulation changes, things that aren't really natural climate variability, but effects of this cl climate change different sig climate change driven signal causing this, the Gulf Stream to be systematically more prominent, both now and moving forward, might continue to, ex to, to cause very high warming even in the next 20 years. So three potential scenarios for warming that we can discuss and consider. And of course, all these can have uh, firmer numbers put on them through careful analysis of, of different projections. Let's talk next about acidification. Um, when we look at the global patterns of acidification, again, we see this very clear, consistent response across almost all areas of the ocean. And, um, and when we look at the, the response under different climate change scenarios, whether they're high emission scenario or low emission scenario, we see uh, that the acidification response generally follows the amount of CO2 we're emitting into the atmosphere. This is really basic chemistry at a large scale, where on the plot on the left here, the red lines here are high emission scenario and you see a steeper drop in that pH. The blue and green lines are, are, are scenarios that involve more mitigation, less emission, and you see the pH drops less steeply and in some cases might even start to recover. Um, so at, at a global scale, very, very clear response. There's actually about 30 different models plotted on this, but they're all very close together because they're all basically calculating the same chemistry. So you see almost no spread in the response. You'll also notice though that in 2040, 20 years out, it really doesn't make too much difference which emission pathway we start to choose. The differences between emissions pathways really start to manifest towards the latter half of the century. And so what we're, what we're seeing in the next 20 years is more or less baked into what we've already emitted into the atmosphere. There's a little bit of leeway there, but not too much. Now, the other complicating factor with acidification is that you know, pH is relevant, it's, it's important, but it's not really the most critical factor for the organisms that we care about. The shell forming organisms like the valuable shell fisheries we have up and down the East Coast are actually more sensitive to the saturation state of the water with respect to calcium carbonate, the, the material that forms a critical part of the shells of those organisms. And of course, there's also calcium carbonate components in many other organisms in the ocean, but the shellfish are, are most prominent. Now, low saturation states with respect to calcium carbonate or undersaturated water can make it different, difficult to form for shell formers to, to form their shells and for them to thrive. Um, the saturation state is naturally lower in the Mid-Atlantic Bight in the Northeast US than it is in the South Atlantic Bight in Gulf of Mexico. And that's this plot on the, on the left here is results from a summer cruise with the transect shown as dots where they've uh, uh, measured the saturation state. And you can see that values in the South Atlantic Bight near the surface tend to be of order you know, four or five. And then you generally start to 
uh, approach values of one, which is that under saturation mark below one uh, as you move to the northeast U.S. shelf of Mid-Atlantic Bight. Acidification tends to have the strongest effects when they approach that value of near one. And the value of around 1.5 has been identified as where a lot of uh, negative impacts start to be felt. Um, acidification does tend to, to decrease omega, but it's also affected, omega can also be affected by uh, different elements of warming and circulation. Temperature and salinity also affect the saturation state, and the different water masses bring in different amounts of dissolved inorganic carbon and alkalinity, which can affect it. So, so at a coastal scale, that, that very large and regular effects that we see globally is going to be modified by these more regional processes. And we've seen this in the, the, uh, the east coast of the U.S. This is a nice study led by Joe Salisbury, where um, they used a, a, a mooring off of uh, UNH, off New, the New Hampshire coast, uh, to reconstruct past variations in the saturation state and pH based on measurements over the past decade and then using those relationships to extrapolate back in the past. And you can see on the bottom of this plot that the pH is showing this nice regular drop, which is consistent with what we saw with the global models. But the saturation state with respect to calcite is, is showing a declining trend, but actually in recent years, it's stabilized or maybe increasing. And that's because the warm, salty waters that have under, been underlying this very uh, exaggerated warming that we've been seeing in the Northwest Atlantic are also acting to um, to buoy the saturation state. And, and, and so where the, where the warming effect is very negative in one respect, it's actually having a, uh, having a, uh, a resilient effect from an acidification perspective. We look at projections of future changes in the saturation state. This is a study led by Samantha Sedlecki and many colleagues who, who again, focusing on this Gulf of Maine where, where the saturation states are naturally fairly low. Um, they found that um, using a six different uh, projections based on different high resolution uh, models run uh, uh, for the coastal, for the east coast of the US, that almost all the cases involved more, more regular excursions below this 1.5 threshold of this aragonite saturation state, um, where the, the, the shaded uh, area here in black is the current conditions, and then all these dashed and, and dotted lines are the different projections. Some of them dipped under, uh, they all dipped under more. Some of them dipped under more only part of the year. Others exhibited, the red ones here, exhibited very steep declines into that um, into that uh, uh, zone of, of poor saturation states. Um, all of the, in all cases, the, the warming effect of the ocean acted in some ways to ameliorate the effects one might expect if all you were doing was just in introducing more CO2 into the, uh, into the ocean, and that's this thick red line here. So, uh, so what it suggests is that, yes, we are going to experience more acidification in, in the next 20 years. There's no doubt about it, and it's going to have uh, push us into this zone of saturation state where things are difficult for shell forming organisms. But there is some leeway in terms of how much we go into that. And it depends on, on um, co-occurring hydrographic and, and other coastal factors that may act to either reduce that large scale global trend uh, by a little bit or not so much. And so there's a, there's a scope in there that we need to consider as we construct our scenarios. Primary production. There's a very simple theory underlying how primary production may change in future climate, but but the re results have proven to be much more difficult than this simple theory would discuss. That would suggest the simple theory states that in order for primary production to happen, you have to bring nutrients and light together. In the those two factors are often separated by stratification. Light is very high at the surface, but the water is warm and fresh. And it's separated from nutrients, which are deeper, which are higher in depth, and in, in colder and in denser water. And combining the two requires you to break down that stratification to break to bring things together. Climate change is expected to increase the stratification of the global ocean. The warming is most intense at the surface. There's also freshwater inputs associated with ice melt, and so in general, one would expect that to exacerbate the nutrient limitation of the ocean in most places particularly in the tropics and mid-latitudes where 
the stratified ocean has created very nutrient limited states. And that's, that's the upper column of this schematic where you go from a fairly productive system here in, uh, and then you, you have climate warming, which stratifies the ocean more sharply, and that productivity declines. At higher latitudes, of course, stratification and nutrients are, are less the issue. It's more about light. The water tends to be very deeply mixed because the air is cold and it's mixing the water to depth. There's sea ice, there's darkness for large parts of the year, and there a little bit of stratification may help. So very simple theory that might suggest we should see very regular patterns and increasing productivity at very high latitudes and decreasing productivity at lower latitudes. But as I alluded to when I started the talk, the actual projected changes in primary production turn out to be a lot more muddled. You do see a prevalence of purples on this spatial global plot here, which indicate declining productivity in the around the equator and mid-latitudes and a prevalence of green values near, near the higher latitudes in the Arctic and Southern Ocean, which are indicative of higher values. But in general, there's very little stippling on this plot, which indicates that a lot of models don't agree which way primary production is gonna go at a regional scale. Um, and of course, when you look at the global patterns, you see, if you look at the thick lines here, which, which uh, indicate the, the ensemble mean of all the models, there is a slight tendency to go down in association with that increased stratification, but generally primary production in many models goes goes up, or in some models goes up, I should say. So primary production is a different, difficult one to consider. However, there are some regularities um, that we can draw upon in thinking about our scenarios. All models suggest that there may be quite large projected changes in primary. If you look at a spatial map of any one model, you'll see primary production increasing or decreasing by 10 or 20% on a regional scale, uh, they just don't always agree on where that should be, but they agree that it's a distinct possibility that we will see these changing baselines. They also agree that this robust increase in stratification will likely shift to spring blooms earlier in the year, change that seasonality, and also that it systematically suppresses large phytoplankton. So part of the way that primary production is being sustained is the fact that uh, the primary production is being shifted to its small phytoplankton, which can recycle nutrients more and kind of sustain that uh, primary production. But the large phytoplankton that are most critical for many fisheries are often being suppressed. And so, so the, the, the NPP signal may not be as uncertain as that previous plot suggested. Another result that's very robust is that in general, when we look across these models, the projected changes uh, in productivity are amplified as you move across trophic level. So if you get a 10% decrease in primary production, you're often seeing something of order 20% for zooplankton and even larger for fish. And that's a simple uh, consequence of food web dynamics and energetics. So what these suggest to me is that, well, one, considering the potential for shifts in primary production and productivity baselines is probably going to be essential in this scenario building process. Um, because we're only looking at 20 years, we may be able to rely more on the historical record of primary production in this relationship with past hydrographic variability to provide some reasonable bounds for that. That would be very risky going out 100 years because you're extrapolating out of this novel environment, but maybe 20 years we could do that. So um, what first looks like an intractable problem may be more tractable than we think, um, and, but we should certainly consider it as we, we think about building our scenarios. Uh, lastly here, auction, the out of breath part, you see this falls somewhere between the pH and the uh, and the primary production. Models show a robustly exhibited decline, but there is more spread between the different models and and uh, where, where these where these envelopes of change are broader. Um, the mechanisms that are underlying this oxygen change are again the, the warming temperature uh, leads to decreases in oxygen solubility in the water, which naturally decreases the oxygen in the water. Uh, but also that it, stratification tends to isolate water masses from the surface for longer periods of time. And the only way the oxygen gets replenished in, in, in the water up to that saturation state is by being exposed to the surface. So those more isolated water, that less ventilated ocean, leads to uh, a decreased um, oxygen levels. Now, regionally, these patterns can be tricky because regional circulation patterns can, can, can offset these large-scale tendencies for less ventilated water. But the temperature effect is always going to be there. Warmer water is going to tend to have lower oxygen. 
and studies even in, in, in estuary environments where, where hypoxia and, and issues like that can be most severe have indicated that this combination of increased stratification and warmer temperatures is going to lead to decreased oxygen in the system. So I think most of the scenarios we consider should consider the fact that the oxygen is likely to decline. Um, so a few closing thoughts on this, and then I'd like to talk just two slides on, 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 on uh, some an outlook for the for the management part of this this effort. Yeah, just uh, just a just a minute or two left there, Charlie. Thank, thank you. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. So. So, as I said, uh, when you think about te temperature, the questions are, will rapid warming continue? Will it continue at a reduced rate? Or perhaps the climate variability might temporarily halt the warming. I can't imagine any way we're going to go back to those nice cool conditions we had in the 60s and 70s. There's just not enough swing in that climate variability to do it. But there might be a possibility that we might get a little bit of a respite for about 20 years before that greenhouse gas warming kicks in further. Um, with the acidification, we are going to have more acidic waters. There is some question as to whether circulation changes and other factors might ameliorate that pattern a little bit relative to the strong global patterns, uh, as demonstrated by Joe Salisbury's work. Um, primary production, again, the trends are difficult from the global models, but I do think there's, there's uh, ways that we could posit uh, reasonable fluctuations over the next 20 years based on the historical record. And I saw Kim Hyde putting a... Uh, a chat message in, and she's done some great satellite analysis that could help us on that. Um, oxygen will likely go down due to solubility effects and, and enhanced stratification. And this may seem like a huge space to explore, but another key point is that uh, there, there are distinct relationships between these drivers so that there's not, say, 20 different scenarios here. There's uh, a more limited number of three to four set of interrelated changes. The, the systems that have a nice warm, salty uh, shift that accelerates the warming are also likely to have a shift that uh, that helps us with the saturation state of calcite and aragonite and so forth. That they're not independent permutations. They're, they're sets of possible combinations of oceanographic drivers moving forward. Of course, there's a few wild cards here, harmful algal blooms, regime shifts associated with food resources. I'm gonna let the panelists hit those. Last thought I'd like to hit on as we think about management strategies is, is we do want to outline the range of scenarios we, we have uh, over the next 20 years, but I'm also really curious on what the potential value of being able to anticipate those scenarios over, over the next 20 years. We have been developing uh, models and, and technologies that might help us to gain the odds a little bit to say that we're likely to, to, to go into one of those three temperature regimes or more likely than not. Analysis of decadal prediction experiments, such as the one shown here, for example, show that we can actually skillfully um, predict whether the next 10 years might be in the warm third, the moderate third, or the cold third relative to the past 50. Sort of a question that could be useful, and I'm kind of curious if we can push this a little further. Might that help us develop more efficient and effective management strategies moving forward? And lastly, I'd just like to point that one of the key limitations we've had is is, is what we really need is, is uh, ocean predictions and projections that span the range of ocean features, cross management relevant timescales at the high resolutions needed for coastal processes, processes. And I'll just mention that we are developing these within NOAA and I look forward to kind of in, continuing to engage with the communities developing the scenarios as these new tools come online, because I think they'll really help us to pin down some of those numbers. So, thanks. John. John. Charlie, th thank you very much, and uh, uh, again, my, you know, my, my thanks to you, and my, also my apologies for for asking you to cover so much ground in in so little time. So uh, um, that, uh, that that's great. I I love the way in which uh, clearly this is this is you know there are no straightforward answers, um, but you were able then to to think well this might not be as complicated as twenty different scenarios. There could be a handful. That ultimately, ultimately, we might um, we might develop there. So, thank you very much for that. Um, I just also want to um, raise people's awareness that what Charlie did there was focus very much on a few of those drivers of change. Clearly, temperature, 
acidification, primary production. Um, we set a set. We, we had a set of briefing materials that hopefully you had a, a, a chance to kind of take a look at. Um, that's got uh, some some simple information about those. They've also got um, other information about other um, potential drivers. Uh, such as sea level rise and extreme weather events and the cold pool and so on. So there, there is some extra material and maybe um, some of our panelists might might well um, pick up on, on some of those. I'll also remind you and encourage you to ask any questions in the chat um, and we'll get to that a little bit later on. Um, but I thought what we'll do now is we'll, we'll ask our panelists to just just respond a little bit to what Charlie talked about. I'll ask them to kind of maybe what stood out from from Charlie's uh, presentation to them, um, what they would either want to emphasize or reinforce, or maybe take in a different direction, or maybe there's some important things about the oceanic drivers of change that Charlie didn't really kind of touch on that much. So I think I'll just just to give uh, just to give panelists kind of fair warning here. Um, I'm going to go. I'll probably go. Um, uh, Sankey Lee, I'll t I'll ask you first. Maybe then we'll go to Zach, then we'll go to Shannon, and then we'll go to Vince, and then we'll kind of, as time allows, we'll go into um, some conversation from there. So um, maybe Sankey, I'll ask you first, maybe to uh, to to pick up on anything that Charlie mentioned. What you think about these these oceanic drivers of change? Um, what's going to be most relevant? What's most interesting to you? Or most what's most relevant for people trying to understand what's happening to East Coast fisheries? Sankey, over to you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, do I have? Uh, how long do I have? Um, let's let's say okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you like three or four minutes or something oh, like that's, that. That's more than enough. So yeah, uh, yeah it's it's very, very nice presentation. Oh, by the way, I'm I'm Sankey Lee. I'm an ocean rapper at the NOAA in, uh, in Miami. So uh, very nice presentation, Charlie. Uh, one of the I think it's, it's uh, maybe first or second slide. You show the temperature changes in the uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, and then uh, different patterns uh, in the different parts of the North Atlantic. But one aspect, as a physical oceanographer, one aspect that I want to add it to that discussion is the ocean circulation uh, the, in the Atlantic. That is unique to the Atlantic is what we call Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. Shortly uh, in our lab, we call it AMA, Atlantic Meridian Overturning Circulation. So this is very unique feature to the Atlantic. We don't have it in the Pacific, only in the Atlantic. So what it does is that it is it, in the upper upper ocean. It brings a warm and salty water from the South Atlantic and mainly coming from the Indian Ocean and all other places. It transports this heat to the North Atlantic Ocean, and in return, at the deep the water, it take out this cold temperature water back into the South Atlantic Ocean. So if you, if you think about North Atlantic Ocean as a kind of a copy mug or whatever jar, you keep on putting uh, warm water into it, and you are taking out the cold water. So it really warms it up. So atmosphere is there to cool that off. Uh, but the, what, so, so that's a very unique feature that maintains the, the warmth of the North Atlantic. But if you look into uh, the heat content change, or ocean heat content change during the last 50 years, 70 years, there has been really, really a uh, building up of the ocean heat in the North Atlantic. North Atlantic warm uh, is, 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 is responsible for more than 50% of the global ocean heat content increase during the last 50 years or, or whatever. And that is because the upper ocean is getting warmed up much faster so that the Water that is uh, pumping into North Atlantic is really, really warm. But the cold water that is taking out from the North Atlantic back into the ocean, that still has not warmed yet. So it's, uh, so it's really warm. So that is one of the reasons why North Atlantic is getting warmed up much faster compared to other, uh, other oceans. Uh, maybe in some local area, like uh, near the high latitude, uh, maybe Arctic amplification is uh, affecting the regional, but overall North Atlantic is like that. And then that's what is happening right now. But in the future projection is that this Atlantic uh, meridian overturning circulation will slow down in the next 100 years by 35% to 45%. That and Gulf Stream is an important part of the important uh, the components of the uh, MOC. And that slowdown will have a direct impact on the availing 
uh, near the uh, Gulf Stream region and coastal sea level and uh, nutrient variability, all kinds of things, and weather and rainfall, all kinds of things. So I, I just want to add one more. Sanki, can I, can I? MOC into this. Sanki, can I ask you one other thing? Um, I know in, in, in some conversations or in some things I've seen, there's, there's, there's some kind of interesting trend or twist going on in the South Atlantic bite. Um, is that something that you can um, you can speak to? Is it is it that we're yeah, seeing yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the yeah, temperature? That's a, yeah, that's uh, exactly the uh, 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 the paper that we are actually currently writing. So the Charlie showed this uh, interesting uh, temperature trend uh, in the South Atlantic Spite. It's going really down. It's getting cold, which is not very intuitive. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out that that has a very strong seasonality. So summertime, uh, South Atlantic spite is getting warmer like any, any, anywhere else, but it happened only in the winter time, December, January, and February. And we think that that has to do with the uh, increased frequency of the, uh, the cold front down, cold front in the winter cold front down into all the way to the Miami area so that the, it will have a direct impact on the cooling, the Northern Gulf of Mexico, and as well as the South, South Atlantic Spike. And then, uh, so, so if you remember about, about a year ago, about a year ago, we had a very cold temperature affecting the Texas, Texas getting really cold and everything. That's the time the Gulf of Mexico and South Atlantic Spike region gets really cold. So we think that there is an increasing frequency of those cold front coming down uh, into the, this area, making that area really, really cold. So that's, that's kind of intuitive, but there is a theory that global warming will induce, we increase the frequency of those uh, cold penetration shifts. All right, Sankey, th thanks so much for, uh, for, for raising that. Um, let, let's get a couple of other people in here. Um, Zach, I'd like, to, I'd like to turn to you, Zach Cliver. Um, again, reactions to, you know Charlie's kind of scene setting talk here, and as you think about the about the kind of the the oceanographic, the physical drivers that are shaping fisheries uh, right now and in the course of the next 20, 20 years, what what looms large for you, and where 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 would you kind of pay your okay? Well, well, thank you very much, and. Uh... I really uh, appreciated um, hearing Charles' presentation and also reading uh, the report that the team put together. And um, I'm struck as I continue to be and have been, you know, in pursuing uh, understanding about this issue and how it's impacting us about how important this is and um, how it really affects uh, businesses all along the East Coast. Uh, and for all of us that care deeply about the oceans and, and fisheries. Um, I, um, I worked for 30 years as a guide leading whale watching trips out of Bar Harbor, Maine. Uh, now I, I presently work as the science director for my own company in the last um, three years, uh, a company called Blue Planet Strategies. But um, in my 30 years, I got to you know, see a lot of changes unfolding on the ocean by spending five months of the year out there every day observing and, and taking people to see uh, whales and the environment and, and describing fisheries and, and all of it. And, um, you know, I, I think back on in the, in the early 1990s when we had just incredible um, schools of herring out um, 20 to 25 miles where we um, would go whale watching. Uh, this is an area around Mount Desert Rock and the Scudic Ridges where the water depth drops from three to 600 feet. And there's tremendous upwelling there and highly productive area for, for fish. And, and at that point, the herring population had really recovered. And we saw huge um, groups of humpback whales and, and other species um, feeding, uh, big groups lunge feeding every day. And um, now we've we've gone to the other extreme where we're where uh, I serve on the New England Fish Management Council uh, herring panel and, and have for a number of years and we're in an effort to try to recover that stock from overfishing because it's collapsed 
And, and this is also true for mackerel. So I'm, I'm really concerned about how, um, or the connection between climate and forage fish stocks like these and how they, uh, you know, the potential that what um, Charles described about um, phytoplankton and how this is affecting the very foundation of our food chain. Um, many of you know that in, in 2012, with the, we had a very warm winter, uh, extremely warm temperatures and, and lobster started shedding their shell three months early then. And um, the price of lobster crashed because there was so much um, soft shell lobster on the market uh, early in the season. So, um, you know, our lobster fishery is, is a, in real concern um, about these large scale oceanographic uh, kind of um, changes. And um, I, could, I could give you lots of other examples about um, uh, things that we're seeing on the ocean in terms of uh, shifts in ranges of species and, and um, dramatic changes in, in, in things that we're seeing out on the water. Um, for example, ocean sunfish uh, are more of a kind of uh, warm water fish um, that occasionally would come up into the Gulf of Maine that we would see on trips if we were lucky. We, we would see one or two and it was exciting. And in, in recent years, we've been seeing so many ocean sunfish in the Gulf of Maine. Um, as many as uh, one trip that I did last year, we had 60 on the way offshore. We've, we've had to change our business model at the Whale Watch because of the, um, the changes that have been unfolding with the shifts in whales following food. So we, historically, we went 25 miles offshore. Now our trips are 55 miles offshore. We've gone from three hour trips to five or more hour trips. So our whole business model has changed and we've been trying to understand what's going on. You know, we're, 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 our business, the biggest boating tour company in Maine, we're, we're really concerned about this. I'll give you one one other last. Let, let, yeah, let, uh, let, let's make this the final yeah. example, Zach. I, I, I love the way in which you've made the connection between, um, you know, the, all the things that Charlie talked about here and um, and the realities on the water. So, yeah, la last last one and then we'll go to Shannon. Sure. Yeah. In the in the year 2000, we had 162 trips that we saw finback whales. In 2007, we had 151 trips in which we saw at least one finback whale. And then in 2017 and in, in recent years, we've had almost none. Mm. So, the, you know, we, we all know about right whales and the impacts on right whales and seabirds and other things. And I think, I think looking at uh, these species can help inform us about what's happening with, um, with fisheries too. Appreciate it, Zach. Thank Thanks you. so much. We'll uh, we'll come back to you in the Q and A. Um, I'd like to to turn to Shannon. Shannon, you may or may not be able to kind of show video. I don't know at the moment. Hopefully, we can hear you. Um, kind of same question to you. You know, in reaction to what Ch what um, what Charlie spoke of, or Sankey, or or Zach. What what's what stands out to you, or what stood out to you as being? If you think about the next 20, 25 years, East Coast fisheries, what are the almost to you the key drivers of change um, in terms of oceanography? Well, I was going to take a little different approach, if that's okay. One thing that I thought we need to discuss more is actually what's going on with the bottom water. The bottom water has a much lower um, pH than the surface water, and it also uh, is experiencing temperature changes. Um, the bottom water is where some of our most valuable fisheries are located. The cold pools are changing. Um, and we focus so much on the surface water because it's a, there's a lot of primary productivity up there and that absorbs the CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, and it's harder to get the measurements in the bottom water. But a lot of our um, fisheries are located um, below that surface layer, below the thermocline. Where are they gonna move? Um, areas that were no, no longer, ha areas that weren't, maybe in the temperature range because they got too cold before, as it warms, are there gonna be species overlapping now that are competing for the same resources? Are we gonna now have an overlap with um, surf clans and more with sea scallops? How is that gonna change in the bottom water? Because the bottom water is changing. And we tend to focus a lot on the surface water for many reasons. Um, 
but understanding what's going on in the bottom water, especially in the Northeast where we have such valuable fisheries is gonna be really important to understand how the fisheries is going to change. Right. Great, Thank, thanks Shannon for, uh, for, for uh, bringing that to our attention. You're right that it's, it's, it's not something certainly we, we, we took a look at, look at too much in the, in the pre-briefing materials and obviously there's some kind of reasons for that but if there's if there's more that we can do to kind of bring that consideration into the into the scenarios that would be a great thing to do so thanks for raising that um uh let's uh uh before we go to um uh before we go to to vince here um i just want to um mention something there's a there's a comment that's come in from tom here i think um uh, uh, tom nye's uh, about something that Zach said. So uh, I think that you, just to clarify here, Atlantic herring, um, uh, I think, you know, is overfished, but according to the last assessment has not been subject to overfishing. So I think there's some, th 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 there's kind of evidence there around the, around the assessment around herring. So I just want, uh, Tom, Tom, I know you kind of made that point in the chat there. So I wanted to just bring that up. Um, okay, Vince, um, over to you. Um, I'll, I'll ask you as the as the as the kind of the last of our panelists in this kind of first round of questions here. Um, where would you take the conversation? You know, we have we've had Sankey saying, "Okay, you know, let's let, let's let's remember about the, um, the 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 AMOC." Shannon saying, "Don't forget about what's going on um, in in lower waters." Um, Zach raising the kind of the 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 questions there around what this ultimately means for for people on the water. Um, what struck you and what do you think as, as, as kind of some of the really kind of key drivers that we need to be aware of as we build these scenarios? Yeah, so, I mean, and taking from Charlie's talk, Charlie did a great job explaining um, how these projections are made, different variables that are key to fisheries. Um, but that when we're talking about regional um, scenarios, so looking at 20 or 30 years out, uh, you know, near shore ecosystems, coastal ecosystems, shelf ecosystems, like we're talking about for the US East Coast and um, Gulf of Mexico. You know, I, I think Charlie's last slide um, was critical showing the uh, critical nature of model resolution to resolve those uh, near shore regional circulation, oceanographic dynamics. Uh, global models weren't tasked to model coastal ecosystems. They were tasked with basin scale, global scale, um, physics. And so I think for a very complex system like where we live, especially in, in the, uh, US East, uh, the US Northeast, which is at the interface of two major circula uh, two major current systems, the Labrador Current and the Gulf Stream, we really need to be mindful of um, considering that for uh, future projections. And I think those la that last slide Charlie showed um, is doing just that. And we've done some work in the past to explore that with global models and regional models as well. But I think when we're talking about drivers, you know, um, um, the mention of AMOC, uh, bottom water changes, ocean acidification, temperature, much of the work we've done in the, U at least I'm speaking for the US Northeast and partially for the Southeast has mostly involved temperature. But I think what's key when we're talking about scenario planning is the synergistic, synergistic effects of all of these. So changes in ocean acidification, changes in temperature, new species interactions, um, changes in fisher uh, fisheries behavior as new species are moving in and, and and species are moving out of the system. Um, it gets very complicated when we're talking about all these things act, acting uh, together at the same time. But we can look at, you know, what's interesting about the US East Coast is we have a lot of data, we have a lot of observations, even though our observations have actually been declining in terms of our days at sea during a time of increasing trends and variability. But I think we can learn from history. You know, we have trawl surveys, um, we, can look, we can look at change in species distributions, uh, the critical work that um, Shannon and her colleagues do in the laboratory, looking at the impacts of changing OA on growth, mortality, um, uh, feeding rates of of, um, of shellfish and vertebrates. So, you know, I think that that's the critical comp component here. Um, taking all these things together, looking at things at a very high resolution, and trying to understand what has happened historically and how we can use that using models and and our knowledge base to project forward. 20, 30, 40 years into the future when we're talking about these scenarios. But I think resolution is critical. Yeah. Oh, Vince, I, I appreciate that. Thanks very much. And um, yeah, it's, it, it's actually a really nice way to think about what the kind of the, the purpose of these scenarios that we're building here are. It's, as you say, and how everyone, everyone now explained it, everything's very complicated. 
And if we can, if we can bring some, you know, it's not oversimplifying, but if we can bring some kind of patterns to this and say, hey, it could broadly go in this direction, or it could broadly go in that direction, it 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 just allows us to have a kind of, a, I think, a more meaningful conversation with everyone who's 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 um, interested in users of ocean resources there. So um, I really appreciate that. Um, let me just see whether there's anything that. Um, Sankey or um, or Zach or um, or Shannon want to come back on just anything that you've kind of heard in this chat. I want to move on in a second or two to just um, get everyone uh, working on uh, a quick poll, um, and we're going to do that in a moment or two. But let me just see whether Zach or um, Sankey or Shannon want to add anything else for now. Sankey, yeah, just just a quick comment. So the Vince, the the, the his point about the resolution. High resolution is very important. I, I definitely agree with that. But the, uh, in addition to that, um, I think of uh, those climate models, whether it is high resolution models or low resolution model, it just uh, need to be validated. So there is a, there is some effort to do the projection for 100 years. This is going what's going to happen and all that. But we have a whole lot of uh, you know oceanography records back into 1950 or 70s. So, if we can actually validate, if if we test this model, we can do the high cast correctly. If we cannot, what's the what's what's what is missing in this model? Those kind of uh, effort is, I think, it needed, very very needed as much as we do the uh, for the future projection, the validation of the model. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. With that, um, thanks initially to our panelists. If you can stay on, we'll 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 have a Q and A session in a moment or two. Um, what I wanted to do now was just to um, get a get a chance. We've we've clearly heard about some uh, some of our drivers of change here, and I'm going to um, just show you in my uh, slides here if I can get the the proper resolution on this. Um, so many of the drivers of change that, that you've heard about, um, and uh, we've heard our panelists and our speakers talking about them, whether it be temperature changes, currents, um, the, the Gulf Stream, long-term cycles, um, uh, AMOC uh, there that, um, uh, that Sankey mentioned about, Shannon, the ocean acidification, um, very significant primary production. We haven't talked too much about extreme weather events um, and, and sea level rise, but but each of these um, are important, or they, they they could be important and certainly candidates for really thinking about what might rise to the top as for, as far as impact on uh, fisheries over the course of the next twenty years or any sort of uh, work on the water. So what we wanted to do was to maybe take these eight or maybe there's others that you, you want to think about and just a very kind of quick straw poll of uh, a couple of questions here. So I'm going to, I'm going to relay the, the two questions to you and then um, we're going to send you a, a link in the chat for you to do this. So the first question I'm going to ask everyone to respond to um, is of these oceanographic drivers of change, um, which do you feel will have the most impact? on East Coast fisheries or your activities over the course of the next 20 years. And of course, you might say, well, I want I want to answer every one of them. And you want to say, look, there's links between each of those. And we fully understand that. But if you were to just choose, we want you to we need you to choose two answers um, out of the eight. And then if you want to add anything else, you'll have a space to kind of add something else. So the first question is um, of these drivers of change, what looms largest for you most impact on East Coast fisheries over the next 20 years or your work over the next 20 years? Um, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll give you the link in a moment. And then the second question is same, same list of these oceanographic drivers and change. What do you feel are the most unpredictable over the course of the next 20 years? Wh which ones could move either in different directions or move more quickly or more slowly compared to what we might expect? So we're looking here for you to get to, to to provide your input as far as importance and unpredictability. Okay, so we've got you know 250 people on the call at the moment. We'd love you know you to, to kind of put your views in, and we just again, it's just going to be important for us to have a sense 
in which what's kind of coming up for people here. Um, so uh, I'm going to just stop sharing my screen at the moment, and I'm going to draw your attention to the chat box, um, which uh, which is the little speech bubble there. If uh, if you've got it open or if you haven't had it open, Carly has just posted a link to a Survey Monkey. Um, what you do is just go into the chat box, click on the link. Um, you'll have something that tells you you're you're um, temporarily leaving the WebEx. Um, click continue, and it then should take you straight into the Survey Monkey which then will have those two questions that I just outlined there. Now, listen, it's very important. Um, your, your, um, your submission will only be accepted if you provide two answers out of the eight. Not one, not three, but two answers out of the eight. If you want to add anything else that isn't on that list of eight, you can kind of click in the other box. So let me give you two or three minutes to do that. Hopefully you can, um, uh, you can get into the survey monkey and be able to do that. And then, um, you know, fingers crossed, we'll then be able to project the results from there. So let me give you a couple of minutes just to go into the survey monkey and see if you can do that. Okay, we've got 71 responses so far. Let me just be highly new. I think I'm, am I now sharing my uh, Chrome screen? Uh, yes, it's a little small, but. Okay, let me. Uh, you can maximize it. We can see it. Does that work yep. better? Yep. Okay. All right. So um, just based on results, so we look as if we've got 89 right now. Let me re, um, if I can get that going again. Okay, 122. Um, okay, uh, just very quickly as we see that, we've got 80% uh, um, saying temperature. We've got half um, of that saying primary production water chemistry. So, uh, Charlie, many of the things that you mentioned certainly looming large there. Um, ocean currents as well um, uh, coming up as, a, as important aspects there. So, that's what we're seeing on the on the what do you feel will have most impact? Let me just scroll down. Apologies for that. Um, in terms of unpredictability, um, not surprisingly, we've got extreme events um, coming up there with 70% of respondents. For other things, you know, a lot of unpredictability around primary production. We heard that in the um, we heard that in the in the panel discussion. And then currents and long-term cycles kind of looming much larger there, temperature less so, um, people less less concerned with kind of unpredictability there. You know, that's more, it feels like more of a given as far as what we've got there. It's important, but not, not necessarily that unpredictable. Um, let me just do a very quick uh, update of this to see if we've got um, more results coming in from the 122. 129. Okay, so it's not going to change it that much. So um, thanks very much all for uh, for taking part in that. Um, and if there were any additional kind of free form answers, it looks as if we might have a handful there of comments for anyone um, uh, adding some more material. Um, and we'll we'll take a look at those and 
um, that'll certainly be useful for us in the next stages of this. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and now we'll we'll go to. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Kylie and Sean. I know you've been monitoring the chat. People very helpfully have been um, asking questions here, um, as you as they've heard from um, from uh, Charlie and our panelists, wanting either some more information or kind of pr providing a kind of a perspective or a point of view. So let me let me go to uh, let me go to either Sean or Kylie, who wants to kind of uh, to maybe relay the first question or maybe a couple of questions to the panel from here. Sure, Jonathan, this is Kylie. I can uh, relay uh, the first question that that we received was, I, I believe, during uh, Charlie's presentation. Uh, Kim Hyde had asked, "Do the projections factor in?" changes in frequency and intensity of storms that can affect stratification and mixing in regards to primary production. And if there are more strong storms, then that could uh, favor increased primary production locally. So uh, if anyone wants to address that or, or speak to that, go ahead. Um, I'll let S Sankey's, got a, Sankey's got, got a raised hand there. So we'll go to Sankey first and then Charlie, if you wanna come in. Kylie, thanks for the question, Sankey. Okay, I, I didn't. I didn't see each other. Yeah, so I guess uh, I'll just answer just part of the question. So storm activity, I would just focus on the tropical storm activity. So the hurricane, in terms of a future projection in the model, the consensus is that the number of storm will be reduced um, uh, because it's, it's difficult to make a rainfall uh, uh, because the atmosphere can hold more moisture. Uh, especially in the Atlantic Ocean, there are other other region, regions re, reasons too. But the idea is the number of, number of, number of the uh, the tropical cyclone will reduce. However, once it's developed, uh, the tropical storm, many of the storm will turn into develop into category three, four, five. So the number of the extreme uh, hurricane will increase. And uh, among all this model, very, very strong uh, consensus in the model is that there will be increase in the tropical cyclone related rainfall. Rainfall will be increased by 10% or more. And then uh, this could be just a, uh, 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 may not, I, I, I'm not sure if you can really generalize, generalize it, if you, but if you look into some of the climate model simulations, some of the model actually shows some interesting patterns in the storm activity, regional pattern. So over the uh, tropical North Atlantic, yes, a tropical storm number of storm will be reduced, but right next, right east of the Florida, uh, West, uh, West Atlantic there, uh, that's where the storm activity will be slightly increased. It doesn't mean that it is formed there, but more, the, a lot of tropical cyclones will be intensified just over the west of Florida there. Uh, because of the uh, decrease in uh, uh, surface wind this year and all that. So there is, there is very interesting uh, regional variation there. And the uh, NOAA GFDL is on top of this. That's what, that's what. Okay. Charlie, anything quick? Um, Sankey, thank you. Charlie, anything to, to add to that? Yeah, just, just uh, maybe on the, the, the productivity side, I think, um, you know, so, so these models do include storms. They're usually not as intense as the actual storms because the resolution is limited. Um, but they, they do uh, simulate the, those effects to some degree. I, and I would say that in terms of the, the integrated productivity over a year, I think most studies suggest that um, that the storm, the impact of the frequency of storms is not a big driver of that. But I think that uh, the extreme events part of that equation, whether those storms might, you know, those extreme storms or extreme other conditions might be associated with, uh, you know, harmful algal blooms or other uh, other phenomena, uh, and such that if they became more frequent under climate change, would have to be more aware of those outcomes. I, I think that would be the angle that I would be more. Uh, that but that, that might be a really compelling angle to explore is you know how those weather extremes translate into into the ocean extremes rather than the integrated productivity, which I, I don't think is going to be a major shaper of the integrated productivity. Okay, thank you um, for that. Uh, Kylie, Sean, any any others coming up in the chat there that we want to uh, push towards the panelists? 
Yeah, if we have a, a few more minutes, there's a there's a couple more, uh, and obviously we won't have time to get to all of them. So thank you for those who have, have sent in questions, and we'll definitely keep them in mind as we move forward. Uh, you know, so this question, uh, Shannon had mentioned uh, the cold pool in in her response, and I was wondering if uh, the panelists could elaborate on sort of the importance of the cold pool uh, and what we could sort of expect to happen to the cold pool over the next twenty years or so. Okay. Um Maybe Shannon, um, let's go. Vince, you got a raised hand there. Um, uh, Shannon, do you want to say anything first and then we'll go to Vince? Okay, let's go to Vince. Vince. Yeah, so the cold pool, um, we, we have found that um, the cold pool is critical habitat for many commercial species um, along the Mid Atlantic Bight. Um, so between Cape Hatteras and uh, just south of George's Bank, um, in particular, uh, Yelp, Southern New Did we just lose Vince? Yes, I think we lost Vince. Yep. Hey, Sean, let's um, let's see if we've got a um, yeah. another question lined up, maybe, and then we'll uh, we'll try and get Vince back on. Yeah, Kylie, you want to go ahead and give your next one? Yes. One second. Let me find the. Next question. So, um, Michelle Duval had asked, is there a relationship between the changes in the AMOC that Sankey referenced and the AMO and the NAO? That's a lot of, uh, lot of acronyms. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, the AMOG is Atlantic Meridian Overturning Circulation. AMO is Atlantic Multi-Decade Oscillation. NAO is North Atlantic Oscillation. Yeah, so, so the general idea, uh, we, it's widely believed that the oscillation, the multi-decade oscillation of the Atlantic Meridian Overturning Circulation is what is driving the MOC, uh, the, the AMO, AMO there. But there, there are some, some lot of people, especially atmosphere scientists, who disagree with that. And then they say ocean doesn't play any role. Uh, and then it's just the atmospheric noise just integrated to the ocean, creating this long-term frequency in the AMO. But uh, as oceanography, as, as oceanographer, I, I strongly believe that it's a, it's a MOC because uh, a MOC is the one that's driving it. NAO is a little different. NAO is basically the weather phenomena that is like a has a life cycle of seven days or ten days. So, but uh, so that's just just the weather. So let's say we have an NAO now. Ten days later, you have an NAO. That's a completely different NAO. So that's. But that there is a, some interesting interdecadal or decadal modulation of the NAO. We don't know exactly why, why this is happening, uh, but so that the linkage between AMOC, AMO, NAO, that feedback is still not very clearly understood. But there are some, a lot of people who, be, a lot of scientists who believe that that low frequency variation of the NAO is the one that's driving the MOC. But uh, that's, I'm not sure about that. Good. All right, thank you. I saw, I saw Vince reappear a moment or two ago, but I don't know if he's, uh, um, Vince, let, let's check if you're, uh, if you're back with us. No. Okay, no one there. Let me, let me check with Sean if there's, if there's anything else either Either comments or questions that uh, that are uh, that have come in from uh, attendees that we want to share with panelists. Do you think you have time for one more question? I, I, we yeah. have we have a number of questions, but if we have time for one more, I can read one more. Yeah, yeah, okay. please do. Uh, so this one came in from from David. Uh, what about non CO two pollution, such as nutrient runoff? Uh, don't we need this important this important variable in our models? It can have a large impact on ocean chemistry and primary production. So, do I want to comment on sort of non-CO2 pollution? I can, I can hop, hop in on that. I, so, so, of course, we don't have the Mississippi in, in our in our purview here, going from southeast to, to northeast, but, I, you know, there are there are some decent-sized rivers up and down the eastern seaboard, and, of course, there are also the, these estuarine environments that 
that um, are critical nursery habitats and also extraordinarily productive in their in their own right. And I, and I certainly think as one moves into you know for instance Chesapeake Bay, the scenarios one needs to develop would need to include um, you know alternatives for land use and and, and different pollution controls because those are going to have a, a very acute effect uh, uh, locally on that system. As one moves out into the broader shelf region, uh, still significant, no doubt, but but but, but I, I, I suspect they'll start becoming more and more secondary as one moves out into the to the offshore waters to these large uh, large scale change drivers. But it's a it's a good point to bring up um, and a good point to think about during the scenario development. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. And yeah, thanks for the question there. Um, Vince, it looks like you're back with you. We're waiting in bated breath here. We have moved on to other things, but your your explanation of the coal pool was uh, was 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 just kind of waiting there, and then you and then you you left us. So hopefully you're back. I'm I'm back. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sounds good. Yeah. I don't know what happened there because when you said you lost me, I was able to see and hear all of you. So I don't. Oh, all so right. I, I was actively listening to you lose me as you were talking about me <laughs> losing me. <laughs> it was very strange. Um, so I'm not sure where I got cut off, but I'll keep this brief because I know we're short on time. But um, to answer the question, yes, we do expect we've seen changes in the cold pool in terms of it's getting warmer, um, it's gotten smaller, and it's persisted um, for a lesser amount of time. Um, and we expect that trend to continue as the Mid-Atlantic Bight continues to warm. But but there are definitely key commercial species that um, associate, are associated with the cold pool. Uh, the cold pool is critical habitat for many commercial species. And uh, we're investigating some of those commercial stocks right now. Um, but yes, we, that we do expect to continue change in that in that cold pool, that seasonal cold body of water that forms in the Mid-Atlantic Bight um, after every winter. Okay, great, Vince, thank you very much. Um, I just want to we'll we'll wrap up the, the the panel in a moment or two. I want to see whether um, Zach or or or, or Shannon uh, anything that's kind of come in on questions either that Sean or Kylie have relayed or anything else you're kind of seeing in the chat there. Um, anything anything strike you as 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 interesting to you know add to or respond to. All good. I have, I have I have a question for the panel myself, yeah. and it's yeah. uh, for some of the oceanographers. And do they do they feel that um, these uh, o ocean the ocean is more predictable in terms of wild swings that we're seeing on land with how climate is impacting land? Do we do we think that we can we can actually do this? That we can that we can get the science so we can plan ahead. And, and be ahead of the curve, or are we going to enter a place where things start to get really crazy? How confident are, how confident are we oceanographers with the, with the kind of the data we have to hand and, and are we gonna stay ahead of it? I can have a crack at it. The first time I wanted to point out that I, I had my Acadia National Park hat nearby, <laughs> so I, I threw it on my head. As I answered your question, I even as you were talking about those locations, I was missing I was missing summer. So, thank you for that. Um, so, so a, a couple of thoughts on that. First, you know, um, even in the if the in the unpredictable state, if you can sort of bound the range of possibilities, you can sort of develop robust management strategies for that range. And, then, and I think that's a that'll be a valuable kind of exercise as we think about. You know the various contingencies. You know, hope for the best, plan for the worst sort of uh, yeah. uh, scenarios. But I also uh, I I do have some optimism regarding our ability to anticipate um, uh, changes moving out. And, and one of the main reasons why is because the ocean has a long memory and relative to to, to land and, and the atmosphere. Say, uh, you know, once signals are are imprinted in the ocean, they tend to stick around and and and. What we've been finding with our attempts to to predict oceanographic drivers is that the the time scales at which we can predict them skillfully tend to be longer than the time scales which we predict things like the weather, right? Which is you know after five days to anybody's guess, right? And so um, I, I, I'm excited. I'm excited to see this turns out how this turns out. The first step in terms of outlining the range of possibilities and developing robust management plans to that range. 
but I'm also cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to start developing tools that allow us to to put some odds on those outcomes, and so we can make better decisions about about what we do. And you know, I, I always hesitate to use poker analogies with anything, but yeah, you know, I think the hope with some of our prediction experiments is that we can go from trying to bet our hands while looking at say three cards and not having any clue what the other two are, is to at least start to be able to uncover that fourth and fifth card. Maybe just the suit to start, you know, maybe whether it's a face card or not, but you know, to give us more information and and uh, you know, not to sort of revert back on uncertainty buffers, but to start providing that intelligence to make better decisions. So, now, I am a shameless optimist, <laughs> so that's my one caveat. But I do think there's reason for some optimism there. Great, um, Charlie. Thanks for that, um, Zach. Thanks very much for the question. I think it's a I think it's a very nice place to uh, to, to to finish off today. Let, let, let me uh, let me thank our panelists. Thank you, um, Vince, Shannon, um, Zach, and and Charlie as our uh, as our keynote. Really appreciate um, you joining us today and 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 providing your uh, your experience and expertise obviously there are no there are no simple answers here and we don't know the answers um but charlie as you say you know we can we can get better at kind of bounding what we know and what we don't know and then imagining what those possibilities might be um so to with that in mind um thanks everyone for uh, for staying with us um remember this is the first of three webinars. Today we focused a lot on oceanographic. Next week we'll do biological and the week after we'll do um, we'll do social and economic. And I just wanted to 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 remind you and we, we've spoken about scenarios a lot today. So remind you where this is going after these three webinars and in the months ahead. Um, we'll be doing a scenario creation workshop or workshops. We'll, we'll be using some of these most important drivers of change. We've talked a lot about a lot about some of them today. We'll do more in the next couple of weeks to create this handful of scenarios about how climate change might affect East Coast fisheries in the next 20 years. And you know, think about these scenarios as they'll each describe a different way in which future oceanographic conditions might combine with some biological conditions and social and economic conditions. They'll all be kind of bound up and intertwined together. Um, remember, we're not predicting. The scenarios will not be predictions. They're going to be instead, you know, as I say, a handful, three to five plausible, challenging, memorable stories about what we might face over the course of the next 20 years. And then later on in the year, um, or June, um, we're then going to use them. I, I like to think about them as a platform for those important discussions about fishery governance and management issues. So we'll be asking questions like, okay, once we've created each of these scenarios that describe different conditions, what might be the real challenges of fisheries and governance management might face in each of them? If we you know, thought about our own current fishery governance and management arrangements, how would they cope if these new conditions were to occur? You know, are we are we in good are we in um, are we in a good condition? Are we in a good good position, or are we going to be lacking some kind of key parts of information? What would then need to change in fisheries governance and management to prepare for the scenario possibilities? And then ultimately, it comes back to what would be the tools and processes that we'd need to advance or build. So I just wanted you to 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 know where we're going with all of this and how a conversation about oceanic oceanographic drivers ultimately makes its way through to a set of scenarios and then through to these really important con conversations about what happens to fishery governance and management um, as we prepare for the next 20 or 25 years. So I'm going to uh, actually let me just move it on to a kind of final slide here. Um, this is just a reminder of project outputs that we that we you've seen before in some of the webinars um, that we did last summer. Remember, all of this is about getting to a set of scenarios, a better understanding of challenges and opportunities, these kind of short and long term management priorities, um, a list of data gaps. So all of these things are very much in play for what we're doing here. And then finally, a, um, a thank you. Thanks for attending um, today's webinar. We hope you can join us next uh, Wednesday on the 23rd. Um, and that's when we're going to be, uh, it's going to be the same time, 3 Eastern, um, and we'll be dealing then with the biological um, drivers of change. And then a week later, we'll be doing social 
and economic. Um, if you need more information, um, just about everything that we're doing in this in this whole um, initiative is um, recorded and put onto the website there. You can see the link. And if you want further information, um, Kylie Dancy at the, 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 the Mid-Atlantic um, Fisheries Management Council um, is, our, um, is our coordinator of the core team. So Kylie, um, Kylie's certainly um, a great person to ask about any aspects of the process here. All right, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, I'm just gonna say thank you to everyone for, uh, attending and thanks all for uh, your great questions and comments. We are gonna keep hold of all of those and they're gonna guide us all the way along. Um, let me just check, uh, Kylie, Sean, anything else to add to this as we, uh, as we wrap up here, like a couple of minutes after 4.30? I don't, I don't think so. I think you covered it well. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, same here. Thank you uh, once again to everyone for participating in the panel. Thank you for all the great questions. And as Jonathan mentioned, we'll uh, we try, uh, try and incorporate them as best we can. All right. Okay, thanks everyone for uh, for the conversation. Really enjoyed it. I hope you can join us in a week's time when we'll, uh, we'll be doing uh, biological drivers on the 23rd. Appreciate it. Thanks now. Thank you. Bye-bye.